and we've got proper look at this look at these guests coming in now these are like this is serious now it's time to get serious okay this is security this is a grown-up subject right <laughs> welcome everybody <laughs> <laughs> <It's been a laughs> I'm not used to being introduced as a grown-up, but let's <laughs> let's go with it. <laughs> Great start. Welcome to GoForCon EU. Thank you. I uh, I definitely miss coming in person. Uh, I enjoyed all the locations of the past uh, GoForCon EUs, but you know we we can have fun anyway. Exactly, and maybe next year we'll be going to some other place, which would be great, wouldn't it? Looking forward to seeing uh, everybody in person again, and maybe even you, Matt. Well, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd love that. But, um, <laughs> I mean, you, you may, may or may not. Roberto Clapis is also with us. Hello, Roberto. Hello there. Nice How are to you meet doing? you all. Would you also like to insult me? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Why, why would I? I love your accent, by the way. So uh, I could just listen to you, just introducing us over and over and again. Uh, yeah. We can do that. <laughs> I, I, I stand by that last statement. <laughs> That's very nice. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, we've fallen out a little bit because Eurovision happened recently. And that was a song contest <laughs> that we have where the UK got zero points, which is kind of ridiculous. And it, Italy won though, right? Yeah. I still have to figure out what the lyrics mean because I do not understand them. But mm. it's good that we won. Yeah, yeah that, that's that's why we, we won. Nobody else could understand the lyrics because they were in Italian. <laughs> I think it was something to do with how nice tables smell, but I don't I don't remember. We're also joined by Katie Hockman. Hello, Katie. Hi, how's it going? Good. It's good to be here. I feel like you're going to be much more professional than we've had so far. Uh, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe, Maybe not. not. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll look forward to finding out. <laughs> I'm working with me for too long. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. And also Roland, welcome. Hi. Nice to meet everyone. Great. Um, Great. As a as a fellow Brit, I was incredibly disappointed in Eurovision so much so that I left England and moved to America. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know it is a, it is embarrassing, isn't it? It's not just like we just don't do very well, but we don't. Well, with it's zero a, points. Yeah, it's a national tradition. You know, we always score zero points. So. <laughs> Can't stop now. Yeah. I mean, if you, have to, if you have to do it badly, you might as well do it <laughs> as bad as you possibly can. We're not exactly. trying to do that, though. That's not what we're trying to do. <laughs> we think they're good. That's what no one gets. They think, oh, they're not sending their proper things. We are. We really are. That's the best we can get. Okay. Well, we've been asking people throughout the conference to um, ask us security questions. And we're then going to ask those questions to you, and then you'll answer those questions. I really feel like I'm patronizing you with this explanation, <laughs> but that's basically what's going to happen. Um, so a simple interchange, and no one needs to be insulted throughout the <laughs> I so, feel called out. <laughs> maybe, we could, maybe we could kick off with our first question then. Um, and the first question actually uh, came in anonymously. And this was, uh, who composes the security team? And how are you kind of chosen? And where do you come from? Or what's your history? Maybe we could just go, go around and get some intros. Katie, maybe you could start. Oh, um, OK. So I'm going to be the one that's uh, maybe unique amongst the group. Um, so I came into security um, kind of with little background in security, little to no background in security. Um, so I was the tech lead of the module mirror and the checksum database uh, for Go, which are tools that uh, are used by the Go command to fetch Go source code in a way that's more reliable and secure. Um, and so the checksum database was kind of that introduction into security. Um, and then I basically noticed that Filippo needed some help on the security team. Um, so I was like, I can probably maybe try to learn security. We're still working on that. Um, but. Yeah, so I basically been kind of learning as I go. Um, mm. I didn't have any like, prior background uh, in security, but I had background in Go before I joined the Go security team. Mm. How long have you been on the team then? Um, security team, two years almost, maybe a year, maybe like mm. 19 months, 20 months. Yeah, I think about a pandemic and three months. Yeah, yeah, about, about a pandemic in like maybe five months or something like that, yeah. 1.2 pandemics. 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Roberto Clapis. So you, I, I, I used to story? do security um, before Google uh, as a penetration tester, so what kind of a white hat hacker. And then I joined the Google security team. And as I was doing that, I realized that could be of help um, for some things, especially web related things in the Go security team. And so I joined as a 20% um time oh. on the go security team i'm not a full timer and also like katie i'm still trying to learn security as much as i can it's still a kind of an obscure matter for me well there must be always things to learn it's constantly changing and the p people the threats are constantly changing and things i guess right so um that's very interesting uh, filippo uh how about you? How long have you been in this game? Uh, I've I used to think that I wanted to be to work in InfoSec and wanted to be a pen tester. Uh, then I interviewed for Matazano, and that was the best interview I was ever in uh, because I realized that I didn't want the job. And oh, wow. <laughs> after that, I did a bunch of cryptography and Go uh, be uh, before Google. Um, I was a Cloudflare. And uh, at some point, I think I was sending enough uh, CLs, enough PRs to the Go standard library uh, that when Adam Langley had better things to do, just sort of tapped uh, a recruiter uh, on the shoulder and, and suggested uh, bringing me on the team. At the, at the time, I was the, the only security person on the team, and then uh, we worked on uh, devel developing a bigger team as uh, as Go scaled. I joined in 2018, and before then, I uh, I was already working on uh, on Go and TLS uh, when I was at Cloudflare for a few years. Yeah, that's interesting. Then, so you kind of came in through the open source. That's how you got noticed by the Go team. Yeah, yeah, I was contributing to the project before I uh, I joined the team in Google. Yeah, great. And Roland, please tell us about yourself. Yeah. I started working with Go about five. Oh no, in two thousand fifteen, I was working on Let's Encrypt, which is a free certificate authority, which is all built in Go. So I was working on kind of the back end services, and that's um kind of tangent tangentially related to security. <laughs> Um, I was working a lot with the, the Go standard library uh, cryptography tooling. Uh, and I kind of, in a very similar way to Filippo, I think I was doing some Go open source work and I, I was eventually looking for a new job and mentioned this to Filippo, who <laughs> invited me to, to come join the team. So I've been here for about uh, eight or nine months now, I think. Hmm. Not point eight of a pandemic yeah it was um, it, it was it definitely in the middle of the pandemic i remember that yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. very much a pandemic onboarding uh, i we still, still haven't seen him in person yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> talk to him yeah, every day that's... but nope yeah that's funny and it's weird because i remember when there was just a go team and they didn't have kind of sub teams within that so obviously security became a big enough concern that it had to then have its own dedicated focus what is what are the main responsibilities of the Go security team? This is another question that we got from a person whose name is Imad. Um, I think we can all talk about uh, the various projects that we're working on, but uh, there are some responsibilities that are shared among the team. Uh, one thing we do is that we are uh, the group behind security at golang.org, so we triage uh, vulnerability reports in the uh, Go standard library. I saw that one of the questions that came during the uh, the live was about how our uh, vulnerability reported and our process is indeed emails to this address security at golang.org. Uh, so we do all the triage, all the um, sometimes the fixing, sometimes we coordinate getting those fixed. Uh, but in general, we understand the uh, role of the team as broader than just making sure that Go itself is secure but making sure that Go is a tool to build secure applications. Because we can totally be you know, smug and proud that Go has zero vulnerabilities. And then if everybody uses it wrong because it's hard to, to use and everything you write ends up insecure, does it really matter? Uh, so the point of the team is making sure that uh, the 
Go is a tool to build secure applications. So uh, also pro producing features for the ecosystem that um, that Im improve that. And those kind of change uh, over time. Uh, I think uh, Kate, the Katie and Roland can talk about what we're working on uh, right now. But uh, part of it indeed is this responding to vulnerabilities. Part of it is consulting with the Go team about uh, security related choices, just, you know, kind of overhearing everything that's going on and from time to time uh, chiming in if we can help. Maintaining the, the Garrett permissions, that kind of more, you know, everyday security, and then projects. Um, Katie, do you want to talk uh, about fuzzing? Yeah, so um, along with those kind of other shared responsibilities, um, and like specifically with those shared responsibilities, I feel like one of my biggest focuses with vulnerabilities has been math. I feel like I've gotten like very deep in the weeds of very complex math that I never thought I would use, and I love math. I was uh, wanted to be a math major for a while, kind of reluctantly switched into tech. Um, so yeah, it's been kind of fun to like work on a lot of vulnerabilities, not a lot, but focusing on the vulnerabilities that are math related. So that's been like kind of one of my areas of focus. Um, but as for fuzzing, um, that's been a project very near and dear to my heart for, I guess it's been like 14 months. It's actually like exactly pandemic, one pandemic um, that I've been working on this um, with the team. And uh, what it is, it's basically an automated, it's a, it's a way to automatically test um, your project to try to find um, vulnerabilities or bugs. So when you're running a unit test, um, you generate the inputs and the expected outputs. Whereas with fuzzing, you can generate, you know, you can, you can specify what the output should do or what the, the function should do, but fuzzing generates the inputs for you. Um, so the fuzzing engine, which is the basically back end of fuzzing, runs and um, it can find inputs and expand coverage as it runs. And so it's kind of a smart way, a little bit black magic-y um, when it runs. So that's been um, one of my biggest areas of focus over the last year or so. Yeah, fuzzing is such an interesting thing because, I mean, I originally thought it was just kind of random stuff thrown in to try and see if something breaks. It's a bit more intelligent than that, isn't it? Yeah. It's not just, it doesn't just send nonsense. It actually knows a little bit about the kind of data that's being expected, right? Yeah, and it's making mutations based on kind of informed decisions, like maybe it's copying the same part of it into a different area or, you know, it's not just randomly mutating every single byte in the exact same way. Um, so there are a lot of things that it can use to kind of smartly, intelligently travel the path, but it can also use coverage in coverage information as it runs um, in order to get smarter the longer it runs. Yeah, and it is very exciting. I saw the proposal to bring that into the standard library. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's definitely something that... Um, I'm really excited about you. Um, we're very, very close to having something that's beta ready, probably a week or two out or, or maybe even less, um, oh. where people can actually start checking it into their um, repositories and, and running it. So um, people should definitely be on the lookout for that and kind of instructions on how to write those targets and how to check them in and how to run them. Mm. And now if you had a function that took two integers and it's gonna add them together or something, is that worth fuzzing? or other better use cases? I mean, I think that that could be, depending on what you're doing. Um, I mean, if it's just adding two functions, adding two integers together, maybe not. But if it's doing something else, um, like if it's accessing a slice or it's doing, you know, some marshalling and unmarshalling or it's like doing something kind of a little bit more complex, then it's definitely worth it. Um, and, you know, it can be used to actually find panics and things like that, but it can also be used to find bugs. And so, for example, if you want to fuzz a marshaller, um, you can pass it through marshalling and then unmarshal it and then repass it through and then unpass it through and like see, does it actually do the same thing if you run it twice? Um, if you can marshal and unmarshal it, can you marshal it again or vice versa? Um, and so you can actually, in a, in a way, kind of make it property-based testing too, um, rather than just this is a panic that happened somewhere. Um, or, oh, there was a stack overflow or something like that. Um, so yeah, as an example, 
uh, anything that has invariance that you can teach the code uh, works extremely well with fuzzing. It's not just, will this panic? Uh, for example, something I did use uh, fuzzing for was almost a function that added two integers. They were big, big integers, modulo, big prime, because cryptography. Uh, uh, but uh, still, I had a function that does add, a function that does multiplication. And I just asked the fuzzer to give me A, B, and C random values and then i would do a plus b times c and a times c plus b times c and i would check that the two results would be the same and if yeah. they're not something's broken uh and uh i don't need the fuzzer to know what's broken but i i can just have it check okay th do these two come out to the same value since they're supposed to and that way it can find operations that did the wrong thing um mm. even if they didn't crash yeah, I see. Well, you can discover new math properties. <laughs> <laughs> can you? you discover new laws of physics and stuff like that? <laughs> I haven't seen that on the Go blog yet. <laughs> that Not yet. Seen? Not yet. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe uh, I'll pass it over to Roland. Do you want to talk about the vulnerability <laughs> database? Yeah. Um, so the, the vulnerability database has been a a long running project in secret, not in secret perhaps, but <laughs> out of the public eye. And we've, we've only recently um, started kind of pushing the work publicly. The, the idea is that- um, I'd call that secret. Ooh, sorry, what? I'd call that secret. You mean yeah. not supporting yeah. Google secret manager or something, but- Yeah, yeah. You, you, call that, you call that secret, we call that not ready. Um, yeah. <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, but the idea is, is, is relatively simple. We, we want to have a, a centralized database of vulnerabilities in third-party Go code. So, so not just vulnerabilities in the Go standard library, but, but in other you know, popular modules uh, that, can be, that you may be relying on. And one of the main problems with um, tracking vulnerabilities at the moment is you know, if you have 100 dependencies or more, Hopefully you don't have 100 dependencies, but if you have 100 dependencies in your project, you may not know if, if one of them publishes a, a fix for a vulnerability because you have to be following you know, mailing lists or issue trackers. So often there isn't a, an easy way to find this information. So we're trying to kind of pull this information all together into a single place where people can find it, but also build tooling so that you can kind of run a, a tool against your project and see is there any vulnerable code that has kind of snaked its way into your project. Um, mm. which is yeah, <laughs> so that, yeah that, I mean, that obviously would be extremely useful. And I've seen tools doing similar things for um, like JavaScript packages is basically, mm -hmm. they're all vulnerable. Um, mm. So uh, Malino asks, will this work at the module level? Will it just kind of write off a whole module? Um, and if, if you inherit if you if you as a as a dependency on a module mm -hmm. that has a vulnerability if you don't use that code is it is it then okay is it down to that sort of resolution or right so, so this is a common problem with with vulnerability scanners is that often they are you know they don't look too deeply they see oh you are using a, you have a dependency that contains vulnerability therefore we need to write this off entirely one of the the things we're trying to avoid is that level of noise Often you will import something, but you may not actually, you, you know, it, there may be a vulnerable function off in the depth somewhere that nobody actually uses. Um, it, we don't really want to warn you if that's the case, because, you know, that's just extra noise and, and you get too much of that and people will start ignoring the warnings. Um, so the tooling we're building specifically is going to look at the call graph of your program and see, do you, you know, is there a path from the entry point of your program to a vulnerable function? And if there is, then we'll warn you. But if there isn't, then, then we won't. Um, so we, we're tr basically trying to keep the, the noise as low as possible. I would also like to point out that this kind of special analysis is only possible uh, because of how Go works. Because, for example, in other ecosystems like uh, Node, uh, this is much harder because when you import a JavaScript um, module, you might just call it in weird ways, like accessing by strings or stuff like that. While in Go, it's very... There are defined ways to see which functions you are not calling and you cannot call, not even with reflection. Is it just because they're not exported or other things? It's more like if a package has a top level function and you just don't call it, um, there is no way that your code somehow with reflection or other means can actually 
take that function and call it, it will just not be there. Right. Yeah, it's static analysis. It builds the uh, graph of all the uh, function calls and all of the uh, values that you can pass inside interfaces and pass them around and then figures out, yeah, all right, you are definitely not using this whole uh, code path. So we'll just not warn you about uh, any vulnerabilities in it so that you can focus on the things that uh, you actually need to fix. Well, that's, that's, that's so useful. It really is useful. Ronald, did we have another question from the from the community? Um, yes, I uh, do. Uh, I'm hoping that I'm reading his name correctly. Uh, Miguel Angel Jimeno is asking, um, what's, your, what's your view on providing a secure by default and hard to misuse client server implementation for common protocols such as HTTP? Um, I can take this one. Um, we, our view is that for the Go standard library, we maintain a standard library. And this kind of stuff is probably more suited either in a framework or in a toolkit. Uh, that said, it doesn't mean that we don't want to provide this. My team is actually, I am personally working on a secure server side implementation of HTTP that is just a tiny wrapper around the standard library and tries to keep all the interface similar. It just makes it very hard to misuse it. So our idea is to first provide these kind of toolkits that people can just use and use as a drop-in for the standard library. And if we see this is what people end up using, some things might be actually important in the standard library. There have been cases in which features of these toolkits have been just made part of the NetHP package. I don't know about other protocols. Uh, because this uh, this question asks about different protocols. For now, is mostly HTTP. Yeah, yeah, that's something that we encounter a lot. Uh, the fact that anything that hits the standard library is covered by the Go One compatibility promise. And uh, if there's one thing that uh, the web platform is not, is stable. Uh, <laughs> like things change very often for the uh, for Go standards. Go has had the compatibility promise for ten years now. I think we're still maintaining APIs that uh, are ten years old. Uh, and uh, the how browsers work uh, and what the uh, threats are in the web ecosystem change every year. Uh, that's part of why I'm I'm so happy to ha to have uh, Rob on board. Is that um, I don't personally manage to keep up with that, and that's something that is very much in Rob's expertise. That, that's my the, main job. Right. But the main the, the backwards compatibility promise doesn't apply to hackers, does it? If there's security holes, you do kind of patch those up, right? That, that is a big problem. For example, we know of a vulnerability that is in the um, HTML template package that we are not fixing, because that would probably break half of the users of it. And we know that could potentially, in some very specific cases, lead to a uh, cross-site scripting, scripting. And in those cases, we have to decide. Do we break a lot of users for a small chance of a vulnerability, or mm. do we not? And yeah, in, some, in most, I mean, that package has been around from before JavaScript had the feature that causes these. So there isn't much we can do there. <laughs> Yeah, you've got to choose, haven't you, whether you fix it or not, or whether you go and tell everyone about it at a tech conference. <laughs> <laughs> this one was already on the issue tracker. This he is did public. not just drop out all day. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. Uh, no, that's very interesting, yeah. I mean, you know, it is great to have a team dedicated to these sorts of problems because, like, you know, we all get that benefit once things are fixed and as it progresses. Uh, so we do very much appreciate that. Just on behalf of everyone, just want to say thanks. Um, somebody asked if if there are any if there's any documentation or if there's any kind of official resource for how to write secure web stuff. Um, but there are some things you can do that are kind of bad practice. Like, for example, if you don't have a limit when you're reading a, a, an HTTP request body, it's kind of good practice to put limits on that so that you you can't have someone sending, you know, great big oversized payloads. Um, 
is, is there a lot of stuff like that that people should just know and yes could they get that sadly there is a long list and a part of my work in the past year has been to put together this list and try to implement as much as possible in this framework that I was talking about. Um, eventually, we will publish this list. Uh, it's not complete and it's never going to be complete. Um, but there is, as far as I know, nothing official currently available. There are some blog posts, some videos here and there, but I don't think there is a central point in which people can find all the knowledge they need to write secure web applications in Go. Part of it is that in Go is not even that uh, that much of the story. A, a lot of it is just writing secure web applications in general. How do you use all the headers that uh, let you do this and that? How do you uh, protect against Spectre now that we also have to, uh, to worry about? Uh, a lot of these, we try to make it easier with Go when we can, uh, but a lot of it is just complexity of web applications in general. Uh, and uh, f for that, it's always hard to know what's in scope for the language and what's in scope instead for the application. Uh, one example is that um, timeouts. Uh, it, it would be nice to just handle that for you, right? If somebody is holding a connection open for five minutes, that you probably don't want that, right? You just want to close it. Except everybody on is watching this talk uh, through a very long-lived connection that would be very annoying if it closed after five minutes so we can't um, just <laughs> yeah. are we doing that badly uh... <laughs> it might be self-deprecating but it had this sort of nice side effect of also insulting you yeah i you know you're getting better at that i assume it's uh... also preferable that we write the apis such that they can't be mishandled as easily versus documenting how to handle it properly and that's mm. a difficult challenge that we have, because like Filippo said, part of the goal of the team is not just to fix our own vulnerabilities, but it's to actually write our code and, and put it in the hands of developers so that they can't misuse it as easily, um, which is, yeah. yeah, a lot of what Rob's been focusing on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I suppose if you, for example, the default client, the HTTP default client in Go, doesn't have a timeout on it. I think by default you have it's sort of like common practice now to when you cr if you do create one of those to set a timeout explicitly. Would it break backwards compatibility if you just said now it's going to have uh, a, t a different timeout? Oh, and what? not just that. Even remembering to close the body mm -hmm. after reading it, or like yeah. I think Brad Fitz published a um, set of slides in which he explained like six things that you have to keep in mind when using a DHP client. And I think the best solution would be to change the API completely so that um, similarly to the server side version, you provide something that gives away the control. So you write your code in a closure that you pass over. And when this, the DHP package is done, it remembers to close all the things that needs closing. Also, it prepares the thing to have timeouts. But this is not possible currently, not with the Go one. Compatibility. Yeah, and that that timeout issue is something that I had opened before joining the team, and it's sat there even if I've been on the team. <laughs> I've moved from the person that opened the issue to the person that's in charge of fixing the issue, and <laughs> we still haven't uh, uh, made uh, not progress, but we can't fix that one because indeed, if you're using uh, uh, HTTP tra uh, transport to stream something which is something you can totally do over HTTP. You can just keep reading a body as it's being generated. Again, that might be how the system we're using right now might be working. Uh, and we can't just put a timeout, which is an absolute deadline, and close the connection. And if we just reset the timeout every time some data moves through the wire, then an attacker can just send a byte from time to time to keep it open and keep consuming resources. So it's not really a fix. Mm -hmm. Interesting. The, the closing a response body is interesting. For anybody that doesn't know, when you read a body from a request, uh, or when you make, a, make an HTTP request and get back in the response, the body, and you read that, you have to explicitly close that, which I usually do just by deferring it immediately. Um, but surely that one you could, you could make the close a no-op if it's already closed and double check then outside of user code, couldn't you? Isn't that one possible? Make sense? How do how do you know if that is still alive? Like if that's still reachable? 
I think you just close it. I mean, you, you, in your HTTP handler body, you have to close the response. And I usually do it in a defer. Why not outside of that? Oh, you just... mean the handler? Yeah. I mean, in the, uh, on, in the no. server side, in the server side code, we do this. Uh, if the connection ah, yes. is not keep alive. Okay. If, but if the connection, it, in most HTTP implementations, the connection has to be kept alive because that's how HTTP tries to not establish a TLS connection and a TCP connection every time it needs to send one byte. So th those have to stay alive. Got it. Yeah, also, that makes sense. I see someone is asking what is the name or CV of the vuln in the template uh, package as I was referring to. I know the issue by heart is 9,200. <laughs> <laughs> he knows it by heart. He knows them all by heart. Uh, no, that just that one because it bothers him. Ah, yes. <laughs> I thought, it, yeah, it'd be good to do that though. Um, so another question we've had about this vulnerability database is uh, how do you kind of make sure it, it stays valuable and stops being just noisy? NPM audit was the example that the questioner mm -hmm. pointed to as just being kind of if it's too noisy, it's it's too easy to ignore, isn't it? Yeah, uh, it, it's a hard, a very hard problem to, <laughs> to address. I think, you know, uh, our, our goal is that the security team will be responsible for making additions to this, this database. So if you find vulnerability in your code and you submit a report to us, we will be the people triaging that. So if we don't believe it is a vulnerability or <laughs> we need more information, it will, it will go through a process so that there will be a, a high kind of quality bar. But, you know, if we, you know, fingers crossed, we will get a lot of vulnerabilities reported to us. So, you know, if you are importing a lot of vulnerable code, there will, there will be a lot of noise. And <laughs> I think our, our expectation is that the noise that is made will hopefully always be useful. So if the tooling is is telling you stuff, you should listen. Um, and, and, you know, if we if we have to lower the, the quality bar, then that amount of noise will rise. And that that's not, you know, that's not what we want. Yeah, that makes sense. Of course, yeah, and and it matters. And is, is your is your strategy that people should tackle them as soon as you see that that is a priority, is something you should tackle? Yeah, and and you know, um, one of the things we really we really want to make clear is that you should you should fix these vulnerabilities, but also we want to provide information that allows you to assess what the impact of this was on your code. So you know, if if you have um, you know if you have some kind of inf information disclosure bug that is caused by you importing some package and you're you know, building a, a large publicly facing HTTP API or something, we want to give you the information so that you can tell not only how do I fix this, but how did this actually affect my application? And you know, do, I, do I need to tell other people <laughs> that, that we have had this problem, not just kind of keep it to yourself? Um, yeah, while designing the vulnerability database, we played with NPM audit and uh, the jarring experience that we want to avoid is, uh, all right, you have uh, 15 uh, vulnerabilities. Great. Uh, click this button to fix your vulnerabilities and not have vulnerabilities uh, anymore. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Moving on with my day. <laughs> Maybe, you know, of those 15, 10, w you weren't actually affected by, so could have avoided the noise with the static analysis uh, thing that Go lets us do. Uh, to be fair, it's way, way harder to do with JavaScript. Uh, and uh, maybe one of them actually indeed could have led to uh, data being disclosed or passwords being disclosed or secrets being leaked that now you need to rotate. And uh, we want to have fewer enough, uh, few enough entries uh, and relevant enough that people spend the time and then have a high enough quality on the uh, description to tell them, okay, this is what might have happened. This is how it could have affected your, your application. Mm -hmm. uh, but a, a lot of it does uh, rely on people reporting uh, things to us, though. Uh, that is one of the major things I'm worried about. If authors or researchers don't uh, tell us uh, and just fix vulnerabilities silently without uh, uh, without telling anybody or getting a CV or anything like that, uh, we have no way to learn about them. We we do throw all the you know GitHub advisories and the CVEs. So if they are flagged somehow, we will learn about them. But it's important that we teach authors to uh, report vulnerabilities when they fix them, 
uh, and we want to make that as easy as possible. Just you pop on the GitHub uh, VonDB uh, repository, you open an issue, and we take it from there. Right, I see. So how do people report vulnerabilities then if they happen to find one? Uh, the flow is not open yet, uh, but the repository is actually already there. It's github.com slash um, golang slash vulndb. There would be an issue tracker where people can just uh, drop in a PR or open an issue and uh, get them into the process. There will be a blog post, of course, when we launch that. This, uh, you're getting previews. That's why it's not, <laughs> um, not ready yet. And yeah, what kind of criteria? No. Sorry. Go ahead. Please, please. No, if it's related to the uh, original yeah. question. So the, the, the vulnerability database is currently public in this kind of pre-beta form. The, the tooling that we're building to, to do uh, vulnerability analysis is not currently public. We're planning to have that in the public Go tree in the near future. But currently, there is, there is no public code for that. There's also a public design draft. And of course, there will be a public proposal for discussion and uh, approval uh, before it actually makes its way into the Go tool. And what kind of criteria uh, does a, uh, a vulnerability have to meet for you to uh, decide to take it on? Uh, I wonder if this question was about the vulnerability database or about the ones we fix in the uh, in the Go distribution. Yeah, I'd be interested in how you do it today, and because it is quite interesting. Like, how do you decide? Yeah, this is worth spending some time on or not. Um, so for vulnerabilities right now, uh, we are, uh, are not yet looking at uh, vulnerabilities in the broader ecosystem. That's what the vulnerability database will be for. But to be clear, that will always be vulnerabilities that are already public. Uh, we are not running a disclosure pr uh, uh, program. We are not going to like replace HackerOne or the GitHub flow to report vulnerabilities. Uh, instead, what we do handle, of course, undisclosed vulnerabilities for is Go. Go at large. So things in the Go standard library, uh, the Go tool, um, the golang.org uh, slash x uh, repositories, uh, the Go website, the Go playground, all of these are things under the umbrella of the um, security team. And when we get a report about these, we try to um, think about the issue in the context of the stated security properties of the package. Uh, for example, uh, if you unzip a giant zip file into memory, you will run out of memory, right? That's just a fact. Like, that's not something we can do something about. But we need to give you the tools to check in advance for that. So if uh, you checked the size before passing it to new reader, and then you checked the file size before uh, running uh, uh, read on, on the file, and both of those were small, small enough, and you still run out of memory, now that's a security vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And we try to build a mental model of a threat model that we can sustain in the future, uh, because we don't want to fix something that uh, is actually some, a security property we can't provide. Uh, for example, you will never run out of memory even if you unpack a zip into memory. That's not something we can provide, and we don't want to fix something like that and give the impression that that's a security property. That one is kind of an obvious one, but sometimes there's a lot of time spent in figuring out, is this something we can defend against? Is this something that's possible to defend against? Or should this be documented as the application's responsibility? And so, yeah, uh, there's a, a lot of the work is figuring out what the security policy of each package is. Yeah, it might yeah. actually surprise people that like the fix itself is often the fastest part. Um, it's not uncommon that actually the person reports it says, here's how you can fix it, or we already know mm -hmm. the, how we could fix it. Um, but actually determining, should we? Is this the right way? How exactly are people impacted? I mean, just because it's you know in one package doesn't mean that's the only package impacted. So we need to see, is anybody else using this in the standard library? How? What's the entry point? Is Are they vulnerable or do they just call that function? And so a lot of the time that can take much longer than the actual fix does. Um, and so there's a lot that goes into it that isn't necessarily visible to the reporter. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. also yeah. sometimes we have to warn people that depend on that API, because if something gets reported, for example, to the XML package, there are libraries that rely on that for security or authentication or the JSON. Think about JWT. Uh, if, uh, if there is a vulnerability in the JSON package that could affect everyone that uses JWT for authentication, that is bad. So we have yeah. to try to make a responsible uh, rollout and not just say tell everyone, hey, you know about JWT? You should update, uh, update yesterday. Uh, this is not something that we want uh, happening. Mm. In general, mm. when we take on a vulnerability, we try to think, is this something that could affect someone that is exposed somehow. For example, the tar package allows you to untar something in a directory, and that could lead to files being written in arbitrary places because tar files can contain sim links. So mm -hmm. one can link to an, another directory and they, it, just extracting the tar file could cause major problems in your server. Um, mm. but I, used, I used that one once to get back into a, a NAS at the hard drive that I had lost the password for. <laughs> right. <good. laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, except for that usefulness, that <laughs> bit of usefulness, uh, in this case, we can't really protect users because the tar package has to untar and it's up to the to who exposes that feature to the internet. The, the, do the, the question of usefulness is really depends on who's doing the work. If it's a hacker, these vulnerabilities are <laughs> extremely useful. <laughs> while, yes. <laughs> while I have you, Rob, there's a question from you from uh, M. Raya. Just says, what's your mother's maiden name? <laughs> oh, right, right. Um, <laughs> right. It's, 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 not, it's not an information that you could use anywhere. But, um, oh. <laughs> not well, you, are you... I bet you all have like amazing passwords, don't you? <laughs> what are they? Um, we can learn. I don't know what my passwords are. That's yeah. it. Oh. It's that you, easy you, easy know what your password is. <laughs> you don't know what your password is. You just hack in each time. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember one. And uh, yeah. And, yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah, um, the message here, by the way, to be clear, is that you should use password managers, yes. which we were talking a bit of uh, as an in-joke, but no, seriously. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, good tip. Um, any of those tips, by the way, anytime, we, we're happy to hear them. <laughs> yeah. uh, Kate, Katie, uh, yes. a, a question came in about, uh, do you, does the team generally you get take inspiration from other tools and other places? And, in, and specifically, uh, with fuzzing, there were tools already, fuzzing already existed before, didn't it? Um, yeah. So how how does that work? Do, do you allow yourself to be influenced by other things like that, or? Yeah, I think we. Um, I think that we shouldn't reinvent the wheel where it doesn't make sense to, and I think we should take the lessons um, that other people and the research that other people have done uh, as kind of a, a guiding light, without necessarily just always doing it that way, just because that's the way that it is or has been. Um, and so some of the inspiration might come from other languages. Um, like we were looking at, uh, I believe it's Cargo Fuzz. Um, that's a Rust version of fuzz that, fuzzing that's been pretty new uh, in the last couple of years. Um, and then there's kind of older ones like LibFuzzer and AFL and seeing like how do they, how does their fuzzing engine work? Um, can we use similar things? Because with Go Fuzzing, um, we're actually making our own fuzzing engine. So Cargo Fuzz, for example, shells out to LibFuzzer, basically. Um, and so we're not doing that um, because we didn't want to have to have Go developers depend on LibFuzzer. We wanted them to be able to just use the Go tooling that is available already um, without needing to install extra dependencies. And so, um, yeah, we, we've definitely learned a lot from that, but also like GoFuzz exist, existed and still exists and is used by people. And that is um, a, a tool that was primarily developed by um, Dmitry Vyukov, if I can pronounce the name. Um, and that's been a kind of a community run fuzzing tool that a lot of people use and a lot of people like. Um, and our fuzzing tool does have a very different UX than that one. Um, mm -hmm. And there were a lot of discussions about that. Like, does it make sense to use the old one just because that's what it is? Or should we try to make it look more like existing unit tests and existing benchmarks? Like what makes the most sense? And we're still kind of looking into that. And that's why I'm excited about this beta coming out. Um, because I want people to use it and actually tell us, is this useful? Is this clear? Is this the way that you would want to write a fuzz target um, in your test so that it looks like the rest of the Go code? Like, does it look like Go code? Does it act like Go code? Um, and all those questions are 
important answer. Um, and yeah, we're just gonna have to see how it goes. Speaking of rust, um, we got a question about uh, what are the differences uh, in security-wise uh, between uh, Go and Rust, and why? And why would you suggest one over the other? It was um, asked anonymously. <laughs> of course, <laughs> as one does. <laughs> as one would. <laughs> I mean, but, uh, I have. I have literally just experienced uh, a book on Rust uh, to <laughs> to Google, and I, my manager hasn't approved it yet. I'm kind of curious, <laughs> uh, but uh, I mean, it's not actually that that uh, dangerous uh, a comparison to make because the two languages do very different things. Uh, for example, uh, to be fair, Rust is a better language to write low-level cryptography in. Uh, because when you ha have that much uh, attention to put into a specific uh, piece of code, uh, having a, a slower compiler or a slower development cycle is uh, a trade-off you will do if it gives you, for example, LLVM with its um, auto-vectorizer or uh, low-level uh, tidbits like that. Um, on, on the other hand, uh, Go has has had a lot more time to develop an ecosystem of, for example, um, web uh, web frameworks and tooling to, uh, to develop secure web applications. So they are very different languages. Uh, we uh, look look at Rust a bunch, and I'm learning Rust indeed because uh, I look at a lot of uh, Rust cryptography code, um, and. Uh, I think that there are things that uh, where I think there are things where we built also knowing how some things were built by them and then uh, decided uh, whether to build uh, differently or similarly. For example, Katie mentioned uh, cargo fuzz, and uh, I looked at uh, cargo a lot uh, and how it does um, uh, hashes and pinning while de uh, designing the uh, checksum security uh, the checksum database. So, yeah, uh, I think there are uh, different languages for uh, different uh, niches. And I don't think it's actually that often that you are in a position where the trade-off is not clear, where it's just a, a toss-up on uh, which language you should be using. Yeah, if I, if I can add on top of that, um, I think that, for example, the runtimes are so different that I think it's very hard to find yourself, as Filippo said, in a situation which you're undecided because um, Rust runtime for async functions uh, is not comparable to Go routines. If you want to do something in parallel, uh, you might want a, um, a runtime like Go one because Go is uh, preemptive. You don't want one single function call to block to stop the entire program from progressing. And this is something that Go has and Rust, uh, Rust doesn't. If you're writing like um, the, a codec for a video stream, you don't care about that. But if you're writing a web server, you do. So those are things that you know before you start writing your program, usually. And there, I, there I were two so very different <laughs> approaches to, to creating languages as well, so. Yeah, we survived. Yeah, yeah all right. Uh, I, think, I, think, I think we managed. <laughs> I know that everybody in the community wants us to say, Go is better, don't use other languages. But like, that's never going to be the answer that anybody gives. Not really, because it's just it's just not realistic. Like, no one that's would. the clip we're going to use, though, Katie. Yeah, I, I mean, that's that, that only fair. Feel free to make that a meme or, or whatever. Cut out. Yeah. I mean, it's you, only, you can also, only fair. You can also just put it next to the image of me on stage at Gotham Go with a Rust Evangelism Strike Force t shirt. <laughs> we, we can pull that one out of the archives. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. Um, so to a different topic then. Um, so, um, sorry, I lost my thread. Yeah. So, uh, what's the most common security issue you find with open source projects? It was uh, asked by Bart, um, and I will add to that. Um, how do we not end up there on your blacklist? I, 
I have a favorite one, which is very common. I don't know if it is the most common, which is people are using uh, something like check the password of the user. If it doesn't match, HTTP.error, and then they forget the return after the HTTP.error call. Hmm. That is something that I see so often. Uh, I just lost count. And how do we not end up there? Uh, it would be nice if and handlers returned stuff, so you can just return on the same line you write an hmm. error to. But it's late for that, so I guess that's up for the next um, iteration. Yeah. Does that happen commonly in uh, open source projects? Do you think, or yeah? Uh, I've seen, okay. I've seen, like I've personally seen several. Um, I think that static check uh, catches that. Hmm. Uh, so running a static check, or I, I think these days it's enabled by default in VS Code Go, uh, and uh, comes with Go, uh, Go, Go please. So. Uh, there are tools that will tell you about uh, these common mistakes. Uh, I don't use any security specific ones myself. Uh, I know that there are a couple, but um, I, I do use static check all the time and it catches security relevant things all the time. Uh, because at the end of the day, a lot of the security bugs are first bugs. Uh, and sometimes asking how do we avoid security bugs is like asking how do we avoid bugs. And yeah. for that, you know, it's just uh, a, a wide a, a wide discussion that uh, go designers of the Go language had a lot of thinking about. But yeah, a lot of the time it's just us. like being too clever using recursion where it shouldn't be <laughs> recursion. Using like just just trying to be kind of cute about it. It's like no, just like write code that's readable as much as you can, and think about the person who's going to be touching it later um, mm -hmm. because there will always be somebody and it might be you and you might not even remember what you wrote. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's not necessarily just a specific to security thing. Yeah. Also yeah. what, what Katie said is fundamental because most of vulnerabilities we found even in our code in the standard library are inside very complex code. Yeah. So keep it simple would be my, <laughs> yes, yeah. number of times uh, code, code reviews uh, from uh, Roland or Katie or Rob is like, yeah, that's that's clever. Don't. Fair enough, <laughs> deleting it. <laughs> Something to right, gotcha. that's not a compliment in, on the Go team. Not really. No. no. Sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. I think I, I gave one to Roland the other day. I said, like, this is clever. I like this. And I wasn't trying to be facetious. Um, right. Generally Roland, speaking. did you take it? Do your feelings hurt? Oh, no. <laughs> Okay. So, you know, I, I rarely get called clever, so I, I take that <laughs> as a win. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's a shame. Well, I think <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, this you know this has been so good and so helpful. So thank you all so much. Um, we've we're, we're running out of time, um, so we can just hang out for a few minutes. But uh, yeah, I should just say that we have a, a networking session that's going to be uh, you know. In, in the rooms, you can go over to the, um, the the nice streaming rooms and hang out with people still for a little longer. And then later, um, not much later, we have uh, a go time episode that we're doing. This is at quarter past this next hour. Everything's in relative time because we're spread all over the place. Um, so yeah, get on board with that. We're going to be doing a live podcast um, as well as part of the conference. Um, this has been awesome. Is there any, anything else you want people to know to make things more secure? I think the tip of like keep things simple just really kind of has a ripple effect of benefits, doesn't it? And it applies not just to code, but architecture and really everything. The simpler yeah. you keep it, the less likely you're going to run into these issues, right? And don't re-implement stuff that already exists. Or like if you have to decide between a fast package, a package that pr promises to be fast or a package that promises to have a good API, don't go for fast un unless you really know you need it. Like benchmark before switching to, I don't know, fast HTTP. Mm. It's a good Fa faster will have to be more complex. That's, yeah. that's Always. just a trade-off. It's not uh, a quality matter, but uh, uh, where do you pour your complexity budget in? Yeah, mm. Philippe, but where are the tenets? There's like the kind of pillars of security that I think you yeah, actually the... wrote where performance is one of them, but it's like the lowest, I think. Uh, 
Ah, yes, I know what we were talking about. Um, those are the crypto cryptography design principles. Those are um, how we decide uh, how to develop the Go cryptography libraries. I think it's golang.org slash design slash cryptography dash, dash principles. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, I think it goes um, uh, secure, safe, uh, um, useful, uh, modern, and uh, performance is just part of being useful. If it's already useful uh, as is, uh, it doesn't need to be faster. Uh, some of our encryption primitives are really not the fastest implementations you'll find out there. But sometimes there are one hundredth of the lines of code. Mm -hmm. And when somebody comes and is like, I can make it two times faster by adding 4,000 lines of assembly, <laughs> and, and often making mm. something more secure is going to make it less fast. That's just almost always inherent to the design of those kind of cryptographic APIs. So, another thing you can do if you want to make your code faster is put some sleeps in before, and then <laughs> one of the sprints just take those out and be like, "Yeah, we've really improved performance." Here. I like that. Or you can delete it. <laughs> or delete it. <laughs> yeah, I could just return. Yeah, way faster. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, but the, the sleep thing that you said is not so um, false because th this is what we do every time the runtime, the go runtime or the go compiler <laughs> emits something faster. Our code gets faster, and I didn't do anything. So, I mean, that's you good took credit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Same Thanks for so us, much for hosting us, by the way. Appreciate yeah. it. Oh no, Thank it's you. been my absolute pleasure. This was, I was, this was fun. Yeah, it was very fun. I've just been told, actually, for a security panel, this has been probably the most fun I've ever seen. <laughs> no, no offense. Normally, you guys are boring. Okay? I know, it's only fair. I've just been told uh, that the podcast starts at half past this hour. So uh, just a correction there. 30 minutes, that is. Or uh, what's that in pandemics? It's too small, isn't it? Too small. Like too point small. zero yeah. one per dinner, maybe? <laughs> probably much less than that, probably. No, yeah, I, yeah. I feel like during pandemics, time doesn't really pass. So it's it's uh, all infinite. That's true. Right. <laughs> it's a divide by zero error. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much. This really is the end of it. Katie, Roberto, Filippo, Roland, thank you very much. Thanks so much. See you next time. Thank you, thank thank you Matt. Matt. Thank you.